I've been obsessed with seahorses really ever since I did my PhD on them at Cambridge. Um, there's so much that I like about them, but I'm particularly keen on the fact that they're the only fish that holds your hand. If you tickle them in the wild, they'll let go and grab onto your finger instead, which gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. But they're also quite beautiful, magical creatures in their own right. Sometimes they look positively ethereal. They're just, um, their shape is almost unbelievable. Most people are surprised that seahorses actually exist, believing them to have been mythical. But exist they do, and they come in lots of shapes and sizes. Uh, well, actually one shape, but many sizes. The smallest species is about the size of your baby fingernail, and it's called a pygmy seahorse. Here you have a golden couple. You can see they're almost the size of the little coral polyps or flowers among which they live, and they're perfectly camouflaged for this environment. In fact, camouflage is the way that most seahorses actually survive um, and don't get eaten. Here you see another species at the other end of the size range. This would be about 30 centimeters to a foot long and is found in the Caribbean, again matching its background quite marvelously. They also change colors, but more briefly when they want to dance and display to each other. So every day, um, the male and female come together and they promenade and twirl and do a graceful ballet across the ocean bottom. Now the males are pretty much perpetually pregnant during the breeding season, but the day that the male actually gives birth, the female's there again for this greeting display, and this time it turns into a whole courtship. So they continue on dancing for many, many hours, and then they eventually rise through the water column. And on the left of your picture here, you can see the female, and she's got her egg depositor in the male's brood pouch, which is on his tail, and she's transferring the eggs over. Then the male fertilizes them and looks after them. The female's done. And what's quite remarkable here is that the male knows he's the father. That's pretty rare. Even most men don't actually know they're the father of their babies. And it's probably because of that certainty that he invests so much in what is really an elaborate pregnancy. So he provides oxygen and nutrition, and he controls the pouch environment until eventually the young are ready to come out. And he pumps and thrusts in a form of labor that just goes on for hours, pushing out these scads of little baby seahorses, each maybe again about the size of your baby fingernail. And they'll be anything from, oh, six to 1,500, depending on the species. The pregnancy will have lasted something between 10 days and six weeks. Um, and yet, he's back to it again the next day mating with the female. If there's ever a baby fish that can be called cute, I think it has to be this little seahorse who's now on its own to do, um, to survive as best it can. Now I've most, for many, many years, I worked underwater looking at these seahorses and here you can see just how difficult they are to spot. Uh, we've made it a bit easier by putting a tag around their necks which gives them an individual identification so that we can see which males and females are doing what at what times. Um, the, the tags don't affect their survival actually in the wild. And then um, after years of working on these seahorses as a, as a biologist committed to understanding the evolution of sex differences, I suddenly found that there was a big pressure being placed on these animals as a result of a huge trade in seahorses. So I set off and tried to track that around the world, and it was the first time we'd really tried to document this. And here you see me in a Chinese market looking at seahorses that are being hung up to dry. Once they're dried, they're sold for use in traditional medicines for a whole host of medical needs. Um, seahorses are also caught in quite big numbers for the aquarium trade as pets and for display animals, and a lot um, they're dried for use as curiosities in things like key rings. Um, the actual extraction of these animals um, is done by some of the world's poorest fishers, people who go out and desperately get whatever they can to feed their families. And here this guy has been swimming all night in the Philippines, catching really very little indeed, including some seahorses. But seahorses are also caught in some of the world's most ridiculous fishing gear, shrimp trawls. In this picture you can see that the shrimp are almost impossible to detect. You only get about 5 to 15 percent shrimp, and the other 85 to 95 percent is stuff that you didn't mean to catch, among them seahorses. Most of these Fishes don't have much charisma, but seahorses can represent this problem in a way that we try to use to um, get some policy response on it. Seahorses also represent their habitats, so they live in seagrasses and mangroves 
and coral reefs and estuaries and seaweed beds, all sorts of really threatened and very, very important aspects of our ocean. And um, you can get people to care about these areas by talking about seahorses as well. And we are going to need people to care about, well, seahorses specifically, but also their habitats and the oceans in general. Um, human need is just overwhelming us, particularly in coastal areas. This is an island, yes, under, under those houses is indeed an island, where many of the fishers that we work with in the Philippines actually live. And they leave these houses every day to go and grab whatever they can from the ocean to feed their families and, of course, to sell. This um, realization that we've got a collision between marine life and human need has really created the approach that we use in Project Seahorse. So in my team, we recognize that, of course, seahorses are absolutely wonderful and very important, but we also um, understand that you've got to look after their habitats and their environments. And we realize that there's another ring of pressure, which is the human need, of course. So you've got to work with the fishers who are dependent on this resource. Um, so they have choices and they will do better if their kids are in school and their families are fed and they have decent housing then they might make more decisions that are are more favorable for seahorses and around that of course um, it's important if the government is providing a situation where there's law and order and economic opportunity that means that you need to promote good governance as we do at these provincial layers and then here in the philippines at the national layer Eventually, in our world now, you have to work with the, the global situation, the international conventions, because they either enable or really um, create problems for conservation action. Ultimately, of course, we, we hit the um, human behaviors that reflect greed and altruism, and they have to be addressed too through education and discussion. But all these concentric rings of pressure bear down on the seahorses at the center of our onion world. And in my team, we've long realized that you can't just work with seahorses, that you have to address as many of these pressures as possible in an integrated fashion. And there's times when I'm working at a UN meeting, for example, that it feels a long way from those seahorses that I first knew in the basement of the Cambridge Zoology Department. And yet, it all still comes together in an emotional commitment to our oceans and, and really helps me to keep moving forward.